All right, listen, f***ers, we gotta talk about Jurassic World Dominion. Colin Trevorrow sat himself back behind the seat of a velociraptor to bring you another T-Rex-sized dose of Jurassic joy. And this is how you treat him? Look, there's no two ways about it. The hyperbolic eruption of vitriol that has constituted the reaction to this film is just ridiculous. It's film Twitter being film Twitter, which is to say that these takes are a big old pile of shit. I'm just gonna come out and say it. I saw Jurassic World Dominion and gasp. I really enjoyed it. I had a great time in the theater, goddammit. I'm not gonna apologize for knowing what movie I was in for and enjoying the ride. I'm not going to pretend that this movie should be up for the Oscar for best screenplay or tell you that it's the best Jurassic movie ever because neither of those things are true. But it's simultaneously not the worst Jurassic film ever. By some margin, too. I mean, at least Dominion doesn't have this in it. Alan. And it definitely isn't the worst film of 2022. Have we already forgotten that Morbius and Uncharted exist? Jurassic World Dominion is a fun movie that really amps up the action from the first two Jurassic World films. And that's saying something, because the set pieces in those first two films are awesome, and reunites the OG trio of Goldblum, Neil, and Dern, which is worth the price of admission alone, although admittedly they could have done a little more than that and really give them a final adventure for the ages. And if you watch Jurassic Park for the dinos, well, I think you're gonna have fun on that basis alone. But this film also has a surprisingly strong beating heart beyond just bringing the trio we love back together, and I think the screenplay has a bit more on its mind than people are really giving it credit for. It can be silly, it can even reach into B-movie schlock, but I also think that tone is apropos to the best films in the series. And who doesn't love a good B-movie anyway? Isn't that a quality any good dinosaur movie should have? And yes, I know the original Jurassic Park did a little bit more there too, but come on. You're not gonna reach those heights. Okay, I can hear you already, but Griffin, aren't you just proclaiming Dominion as a B-movie to excuse the problems with its story? Well, no, because while the film definitely has too many moving parts and juggling way too many characters, it's also far from being the disaster people are making it out to be. I think there are some really strong ideas and themes that make the movie compelling on top of being really enjoyable. I think the central predicament of the film, the one instigated by Fallen Kingdom where humans and dinosaurs now cohabitate the Earth, gives us the universe of Jurassic Park in its most interesting form since the original. There's just an undercurrent of stakes that are present right from from the start because this is an Earth not only familiar to our reality but unprecedented in the history of the franchise as well. Of course, that leads us into what is probably one of the core reasons why people think this film is tired and proof the franchise has run its course. Biosyn Genetics. Uh, you know, the bad guys. Big surprise, it's not as if the big corporation has been the villain in every single other Jurassic film or anything. To the credit of the film though, I don't think it really wastes any time trying to pretend that Biosyn aren't the bad guys. I mean, dinosaurs can teach us more about ourselves. They're doing genetic experiments on dinosaurs? Yeah, they must be altruistic, huh? And sure, Biosyn might have the Dr. Woos or Ian Malcolms in their ranks who want to improve life to do things like study the dinosaurs' immune systems to improve our own, but for most of the company, and especially the higher-ups, they're just another set of greedy, malevolent pricks who you can't wait to see get their comeuppets in the jaws of a dinosaur. But the bad guys in Dominion also represent an evolution across the three films, from those trying to create a new breed of deadly dinosaur to serve as a theme park attraction in Jurassic World, to those trying to smuggle dinosaurs off of Isla Nubart for profit in Fallen Kingdom, to finally the type of uber-capitalist Tim Cook-type exploitative monsters represented by Dodgson in Dominion, you get an escalating threat with commensurately escalating stakes. Because of this escalation combined with how hard all three Jurassic World movies particularly double down on the idea that the pursuit of capital perverts science and that man's belief it can control nature is hubris makes it feel even more like a cohesive trilogy. Now that's not to say these ideas aren't present in the previous three Jurassic Park films, it's just that the Jurassic World films, and particularly Dominion, take that idea to the next stage of its evolution. What if the expedition on Isla Sorna and Nublar were just the beginning? 
Where would we go from there? Well, Jurassic World had the answer with turning it into a full-blown Disney World-esque theme park. Colin Trevorrow took Hammond's absurd fantasy, realized it, and used it to make a more meta commentary on humanity's relationship with capital at the expense of the environment. In Jurassic World, InGen are never pretending to be interested in anything more than just amusement parks. Science is just the means to create the attractions. In Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, the exploitation goes through the next stage, profiting off of what's essentially an endangered species on the black market, resurrecting, experimenting on, abusing the power of gene splicing to create weapons of mass destruction, which is the logical progression of Hoskins' ambitions for the dinosaurs in Jurassic World. This eventually leads us to Biosyn in Jurassic World Dominion, and yes, before you go rolling your eyes at the fact that the evil corporation is named something so on the nose as Biosyn, let's take a trip back to Michael Crichton's original Jurassic Park novel, shall we? Oh, would you look at that? Dodgson worked for Biosyn in the original novel. Now, granted, it's not in the Jurassic Park film, but it does indicate where Trevorrow's head was at. And it's also just a great callback to the work that started it all. Where were we? Oh, right, Biosyn. The main difference between Biosyn and InGen is that Biosyn is claiming to be striving for scientific progress, while InGen, as we already discussed, wants to put butts in seats. It's sort of a microcosm for the evolution of capitalism over the 35 odd years since the release of the original Jurassic Park. InGen is more in line with traditional capitalists, whereas Biosyn is very much representative of the new age. Tech companies such as Tesla, Amazon, Amazon, Apple, Dodgson and the rest of Biosyn seem to think they're more enlightened than those that came before. I literally think there's a line in the movie where they say as much, which is why he seems so genuinely upset when the same thing that happened to every Jurassic Park ends up happening to his reserve. It's the same old shit packaged with a cute little green leaf on it. It's like Facebook coming in and being hailed as some kind of media disruptor, only to just be discovered as yet another media company, one that's maybe even worse than companies it came to replace. Or perhaps more accurately, Tesla coming in claiming to be this eco-friendly startup that will revolutionize the market with its high-tech innovations, but really just being yet another high-polluting, tax-evading, employee-abusing manufacturer. If Jurassic World was the revamp of Jurassic Park with all the same problems, Biosyn is a revamp of InGen with all the same problems. And they'll always have the same problems because it's dictated by capitalists, not scientists. It's people thinking with their pockets rather than their souls. The reason these companies always think about whether they could rather than whether they should is because could makes money and should stands in the way of that money. Another idea the film revisits, particularly from Fallen Kingdom, is responsibility. Are we responsible for dinosaurs or should we get rid of them? A select few tampered with natural law, played God, resurrected an invasive species and dumped the problem onto the lap of younger, future generations to deal with, forced them to find a solution as to how we can coexist, cohabitate the planet. Sound familiar? We're currently facing real environmental issues that will determine the longevity of our species and the planet, and we're forced to answer some of the most difficult, seemingly impossible questions as to how to resolve these issues. Colin Trevorrow doesn't have the answers, and I respect the fact that he doesn't try to act like he does. He has the broad strokes, inklings, but largely sidesteps specific solutions because he's not an expert. Some may take issue with that approach to the script, and honestly, I can't blame them, but I respect an artist who knows their limits. In any case, Genie's out of the bottle, so we probably can't get rid of the dinosaurs entirely, so what do we do? Nurture and control what exists? Let life find a way and do nothing? Or run illegal dinosaur breeding facilities, underground dino fights, trafficking rings, and a black market for these creatures? Naturally, human beings being human beings, they go with the third option. Our world fundamentally changes into a wildly precarious state overnight, one where creatures not known to our planet for millions of years aren't just on a couple of islands off of Costa Rica, but practically next door, and we exacerbate the state. Find a half dozen ways to exponentially increase our chances of extinction for profit? Why not? This is what we're doing in real life with the environment, and I have no doubt that if this movie were actually happening, we'd be exactly the same with dinosaurs. No reason, just tunnel vision and short-term thinking with catastrophic results. The film emphasizes how we lack dominion over nature, natural law, are subordinate to it. We made a mistake resurrecting dinosaurs and the hubris to believe we could do so 
so, and now we have to learn to live with that mistake because it's irreversible. Just like when we created the atomic bomb, humanity must learn to live a new normal and adapt so as to not destroy our ecosystem. Fallen Kingdom shows how that power can be exploited as a weapon. Dominion shows how doubling down on that exploitation, tampering with genetic power we know very little about or really have any business tampering with, will lead to ecological collapse. Again, maybe the movie doesn't give this idea enough real estate, let alone depth, but it's not impotent with this commentary either. A big part of what makes this work for me is that when we pick back up with our heroes, the movie doesn't just let them off the hook either. Claire and Owen, despite their best intentions and efforts, failed to prevent this situation from happening, and Claire especially feels very guilty about the role she played in not only the creation of Jurassic World, but in how she endangered the lives of her nephews in the process. It's part of the reason why she feels like more of a mama bear to Maisie. And so carrying on from Fallen Kingdom, Claire continues to spend her time fighting for dinosaur rights, breaking up breeding facilities as a form of atonement, but is doing so on such a micro scale, missing the big picture, that it hasn't amounted to much of a change. Owen, on the other hand, works as a dinosaur herder in Montana, a sort of controlled isolation and contribution to helping these creatures survive as his self-imposed penance. Claire and Owen are isolating, thinking they can get away, protect Maisie, live in hiding, away from the world's problems and their past traumas, and be fine. But sometimes the world comes knocking on their door. They're in a very similar spot to where Malcolm was at the beginning of The Lost World, really. Clearly dealing with trauma and even regret, and burying it in hiding alongside themselves. It eventually catches up to them because you can only hide from these issues for so long, and sooner or later they're forced to reconcile with the changes to the world, forced to coexist instead of isolating from it. And they learn that lesson in a very harsh way when Beta, the Child of Blue, and Macy are abducted. Speaking of Macy, I also really love what the movie does with her character and the whole clone subplot from the previous film. She's also working to help the dinosaurs acclimate in their new life because she feels she has a special bond with them. She understands them given the fact that she's struggling with her own personhood as being a clone, a replica, someone that was just brought into this world unnaturally like the dinosaurs. Owen is trying to be a good father, raise Macy, but the fact of the matter is Macy needs to get out into the world and find herself, discover herself, and live, and figure out how she can contribute to the problems going on, such as maybe helping the long necks get out of a weird traffic jam. And Blue is trying to let her child see the world and discover herself. Once Beta and Macy are kidnapped, the movie quickly gets a little too big for its shoes, but these parallels are still there and get established decently enough. They do fall by the wayside for a bit though, while we're reunited with Ellie Sattler and Alan Gray. It is great to see these characters again and go on one last journey with them. Laura Dern and Sam Neill haven't lost a single spark's worth of magic, and Ian Malcolm, who comes in a bit later, is as excellent as usual because, well, because Jeff Goldblum, obviously. And while I think the story definitely suffers because the original trio and our new heroes don't truly come together until the final beats of the film, particularly with how Malcolm spends most of the movie separated from Ellie and Alan, I see what Trevorrow was trying to do. I would also gladly take this story over one where any of the trio were missing entirely. It makes the in-film universe feel cohesive, like it's all part of the same ongoing story. That Grant, Sadler, Malcolm, they're all people who just exist in this world, and that it would make sense for them to get involved because they're the best of the best. They're experts in their field. They've experienced this stuff since the beginning, so of course they're gonna embark on a bit of corporate espionage to take down an evil corporation who's trying trying to exploit dinosaurs, and I also see what Trevorrow was trying to do. Structure a story where two parties are running parallel until the narratives get closer and closer together, eventually colliding into the climax. It's a common tactic employed for television, and while it's a bit bumpy jumping back and forth here, I think everything manages to come together in the end in a satisfying way. And honestly, just like how I appreciate the allegory towards climate change and the destruction of the environment, I don't have a problem with the Locust storyline that everyone else seems to think is the worst subplot of all time. The locusts being used to secure Biosyn's monopoly on the food chain and the efforts undertaken by Wu and Dodgson to cover up what is only a side project 
kidnapping Macy to study her so they can introduce a pathogen into the locusts and wipe their hands clean. Killing the locusts and restoring balance to the world's food supply can maybe be cheaply discarded as a feel-good response to the state of the world today, but it's a believable storyline that adds just a little extra heaping of stakes to the proceedings and makes you despise Biosyn, Dodgson in particular, that much more. It's also something we haven't seen before in one of these films, dealing with prehistoric microscopic life forms, the environment that resurrecting dinosaurs would bring about, and insects. It's cool, I like seeing this. It's maybe a little on the nose considering all of the loud controversy in real life about Masanto doing the same things Biosyn are, but sometimes you need a sledgehammer over a scalpel. Biosyn's whole angle is they feel they can control our ecosystem. Corporate controlled ecosystems are simply impossible and catastrophic. We see this firsthand when their locust side project almost brings about an environmental collapse, decimating the global food supply at a rapid pace. And when their entire facility, a corporate controlled dino sanctuary, aka a mini corporate controlled ecosystem, implodes. So the film kind of runs with that storyline because it's pertinent, it's interesting, and it's using these prehistoric creatures in ways we have not seen before in the Jurassic Park franchise. And again, for as seemingly head-scratching as this portion of the film can be for some viewers, I still appreciate that Colin Trevorrow went for it and committed to something different. As Ellie says when she's first introduced in the film, dinosaurs get all the attention, and then she goes on about other life from that era that could have even more catastrophic effects to our current ecosystem. Almost like Trevorrow knew people were going to be like, what, locust, what the f and then quite literally prepared them for it by saying, there's more than just dinosaurs out there. Dinos are only the face of what companies like InGen or Biosyn are doing. They're tampering with genetic power, the natural law in isolation to catastrophic effects. Macy ends up being the key to all this, and I think the film finds a lot of its heart through her story. Another parallel is found to tie everything together. Beta and Blue are identical, just like Macy and Charlotte are. Charlotte created Macy with her own DNA and then altered it to eradicate her terminal disease, just as the dinosaurs were created artificially by Hammond so as to resurrect a long extinct era. And to tie it all together, Wu needs to study Macy to fix his mistake, to reprogram the locusts and stop their destruction of the food supply, to finally do something that Charlotte would be proud of, to make a difference, to use his knowledge, his ability as a scientist for the greater good. And most of all, Macy's mom did all of this to make sure her child could have the life that she couldn't, a full life, which is what we need to ensure for our children. We also need to ensure it for ourselves constantly, which we see in the adult characters, but particularly with Alan Grant. Alan has been living a seemingly freeing life, but the reality is he's often miserable and alone, especially without Ellie. Ellie clearly has feelings for Alan, but she's not the kind of person to be outward and ask more than once if he'd like to join her. She has her own priorities that she needs to take care of. Alan's time in isolation on the dig site has been a lonely life that deprived him of life's most instinctual pleasures. Companionship, a family, all things he's come to realize he wants, all things that could make him happy, and he realizes he wants those things with Ellie. Grant was never an Indiana Jones-esque hero. He's always been a bit off-kilter. Like if Indy's personality in the classroom never left him once he was out in the field. I think across the series, he's often lacked the confidence or ability to read certain cues because of burying his head in the sand. This obsession with understanding life before and how it can help shape life now. He gets so caught up in that that he almost forgets to have his own life, which is why he's pretty lonely and filled with a bit of regret. I think for as much as Ellie's story to Macy about her mom helped Macy better understand her own personhood and responsibility, it also helps Alan to better understand how to find a work-life balance too, which is what Macy does throughout the film. She's the person to help instigate the rekindling of that relationship. That's always bubbling to the surface in their scenes together, but Macy is the one who really forces them to confront their feelings. Akin to how eventually you have to be an active participant in order to save the planet, I think Alan's specific 
specifically is able to finally muster up the strength and courage to stay with Ellie because he's done being passive. The experiences of the film made him active. It's shown him the importance of taking action and being involved in listening. Owen and Claire also learn the importance of listening as well through Macy and by extension the younger generation in figuring out what they want and their often valid but overlooked solutions to the problems that will directly affect them the most. By learning to not isolate from the world and have their adopted daughter ironically in a confined facility of their own when she could be out there figuring out not only herself as a person but what she has to offer the world, they learn one of parenthood's hardest lessons. Man, these Jurassic films really do love their allegories when it comes to parents and children. Even Kayla Watts, when she first sees Macy being trafficked, asks a question about what's happening but then doesn't do anything to actually stop it. But when confronted later by Claire for help, she decides to help out of guilt for having turned a blind eye to the problem, learning to stand up and not ignore what's happening right in front of us. To do the right thing is a common through line for the characters in Dominion. Our ecosystem only functions when we come to understand and respect nature and natural law, and it also only functions through cross-generational collaboration. This film really emphasizes the point that the older generation yeah, they've done a lot of stuff that have probably affected the state of our world, such as resurrecting dinosaurs, and a lot of the older characters in this film feel directly responsible. And what's great about it is that they take the responsibility into their own hands to actually try and do something about it instead of putting it on the shoulders of future generations to figure out. Sure, those generations have ideas, they have things that they want to fix, but it's not going to get fixed by one generation alone. Everyone has to work together, it has to be a collaborative effort. And that's where Jurassic World Dominion really becomes an interesting legacy sequel because again, like some of the best legacy sequels we've seen, such such as Top Gun Maverick, this film actually has something to say about legacy, about doing something so that future generations can live that full life that Charlotte Lockwood tried to provide for Macy. And of course, we have Ian Malcolm himself, Alan and Ellie's inside man at Biosyn, or at least he's kind of the inside man, who's still warning about the dangers and what the company is doing with the dinosaurs and locusts alike. Malcolm has been beaten down over the years, his warnings often going in one year and out the other, whether it was with Hammond, with Jurassic World, or now with Biosyn. Malcolm has even admittedly become a bit more self-serving, lending his cachet to Biosyn to give them credibility and support his five kids who he adores more than life itself, but within the corporation, he's constantly railing against it, and so becomes an inside man for the good guys after Ramsey, Biosyn's second in command, tips him off on the locusts. Malcolm figures he might as well profit off of his genius, even if contrarian to company culture, since that's all the world cares about and try to educate from the inside. It's a bit cynical, but I also kind of like that for Malcolm, because given the events on Isla Nublar and Sonar and Jurassic World, I feel like if any of us were in Malcolm's shoes, we'd feel just as exhausted by humanity's inability to listen and actually solve problems. Dodgson, meanwhile, tries to placate Malcolm's concerns and remarks such as how the company aims for control, not panic or chaos, but Malcolm has none of it and won't listen to this guy defend his god complex. Prometheus got gored, you will too, he remarks, which is a great callback to a similar predication he made towards the big corporate bad guy of the Lost World, Hammond's nephew. Ludlow. He also comments on Biosyn's company culture, distracting younger generations with a hip new startup where there's a lot of room to grow. You can get promotions, you can serve your own self-interests instead of paying attention to what the company may be doing that's seriously harming the collective, the environment, and how that same company is exploiting your enchantment with dinosaurs, with spectacle and wonder, so that they don't notice them destroying the planet and causing our extinction. Another callback to another iconic Lost World line. Is Jurassic World Dominion secretly the true Jurassic Park 3? Anyways, Jeff Goldblum has arguably the best lines, the best moments, the best everything as Ian Malcolm, and as per usual, is the highlight of Jurassic World Dominion. In all seriousness though, I think Dominion actually does have some pretty effective thematic ambitions. I would actually compare it to The Lost World in that respect. It's the first film since Spielberg's sequel to really try and honor Michael Crichton and discuss serious real world parallels. Dominion is definitely pulpier and goofier in places than either of the first two Jurassic films, but what it has to say about legacy and the way our heroes come together in cross-generational unity to combat corporate ecological control 
is pretty effective. I think the biggest issue with this movie is the script isn't as clean as David Kep's was for The Lost World, but because Trevorrow is trying to reach those heights, it's a great closer because things come full circle in a lot of ways to the first two films. The stuff with the locusts I found really effective because similar to literally all of the other films, it's using a prehistoric force of nature to explore a bit more about ourselves. I think people are really just mad that it wasn't just constantly boom, boom, smash, dinos, which doesn't really make sense. There's, there's a lot of dinosaurs in this film. I, did, did you watch the same movie? There's a lot of dinosaurs. A lot. If you came for the dinosaurs, how did you not at least get satisfaction on that level? I think the movie excels on that front. Take the Malta sequence for one. I love Owen and Claire's little spy caper interlude after Beta and Macy are abducted from them. It's fresh, it's different, it's absurd, and it is so much fun. I mean, there's some really great action before and after that segment, but Owen chasing the mercs through the market is awesome. And also Claire on the run from that raptor, there's some great shots in there that are super effective. You feel the intensity, you feel the tension, and the raptor chase that follows absolutely rules. It's every Every bit of hype that the trailers built for it, and then some, culminating in this kind of cool homage to the Bourne Ultimatum window jump. It also reminded me of the Lost World book when Sarah is on the bike being chased by the raptors. Trevorrow was pulling from more than just the movies. He was pulling from a lot of different stuff, and I like the fact that he went back to the source material to find some cool bits to throw into this film and also thematically link it. It's such a magnificently fun crescendo that builds and builds before capping itself off in explosive fashion. If that set piece for whatever reason isn't enough, then how about the Temple of Doom homage with Ellie, Alan, and Macy being stuck in a cave behind a locked door with nothing but a minecart shielding them from dinos closing in as a panicked Malcolm tries to unlock the door? Don't tell me Trevorrow isn't a massive Temple of Doom fan. That brand of filmmaking is all over the this thing. How about Alan going back for his hat? Because of course he would. How about Owen choke slamming a Dilophosaurus and making Nedry from the first movie look like a complete loser? Or how the villain from the film meets his comeuppance by an almost identical way to Nedry? And don't tell me you felt nothing for at least a moment when the new and old teams finally got to unite on screen. Even if the sheer amount of characters within a frame makes it look a little bit like Scooby-Doo and Mystery Inc. Or when Ian Malcolm got arguably the best moment in the entire film and is an absolute badass throwing a fire spear into the throat of the Giganotosaurus. How about when three generations of raptor trainers, Alan, Owen, and Macy save Beta and fulfill Owen's promise to Blue? And if none of that works for you and you demand boom boom smash dinos, well, you still have the big final fight between the T-Rex and Giganotosaurus over who is the apex, with a feathered dino teaming up with the Rex the same way that Blue did in Jurassic World. And similar to the Lost World especially, the dinosaurs tell us a bit more about ourselves. It's an allegory for man learning to coexist with nature versus trying to control it. The Giganotosaurus is the isolated loner who preys upon the ecosystem with an iron fist. The T-Rex and the feathered dinosaur are both carnivore and herbivore. They band together to take down the apex so that a more balanced ecosystem can thrive. It's like yin and yang, old dinosaur with feathers and the new genetically modified T-Rex working in harmony to preserve their ecosystem. Overall, I don't know. When the sun sets on Jurassic World Dominion and possibly the Jurassic Park franchise, I feel satisfied. This is not peak Jurassic, but it is also far above the worst. And it's kind of disappointing to me that most people not only feel that way, but outright despise this movie. I mean, have you seen some of the shit being thrown at Colin Trevorrow? My God, poor guy. And while I feel like the stories of these characters, the original cast and the Jurassic World crew alike reach a suitable end here, I also wouldn't hate getting to sit down again at the cinema in a few years to see more Jurassic Park stories being told from a new perspective. Colin Trevorrow gets a really undeserved bad rap. Everyone dogs on him, accuses him of either pandering to fan service or bad writing, or they rail against him because he actually tried to do and say something interesting, like what he did with the locusts. Except that his movie is simultaneously goofy and fun because dinosaurs are walking the earth in it. He embraces the schlock while trying to make important statements about the survival of our world. I think a lot of his nuances go over people's heads. I really do. He seems like an incredibly misunderstood filmmaker. His whole thing is that he uses the familiar, the schlock, and the tropes, but is super off kilter with it. He's acutely self-aware and even a bit impish or mean-spirited, just like some of Spielberg 
Spielberg's most divisive films. And I think people don't know how to feel about this stuff because it's not quite nostalgia porn, but it's also not quite a meta commentary, even though it feels like it could be. That's sort of why I love him though, and why I really liked Jurassic World Dominion. Trevorrow takes bold swings within the confines of familiarity, and it's an odd feeling for people. Sometimes, yeah, it's sloppily executed. Sometimes it's not as well blended together as you'd hoped, but you got to admire the effort. He's anything but lazy, which is actually criticisms I've seen thrown at Trevorrow, and it's nonsense. He's just a guy who loves the Jurassic Park franchise, has interesting ideas, and perhaps hugged this entry a bit too hard. I also can't for the life of me understand the insane vitriol being directed at Dominion. It just feels like a lashing out because all you wanted was dinosaurs eating people? And even when you get this wacky dinos in the real world adventure, people are all mad because it's inherently absurd, and they don't know what to think about the absurd. Trevorrow is in a no-win scenario because I don't think people know what they want when it comes to these movies, and that's why a lot of people don't really care for the sequels to Jurassic Park. It captures the spirit of Crichton arguably better than any of the other post-Lost World films, while trying some new things and occasionally dipping a toe into the familiar, which I honestly think Trevorrow understands how to do, and do it without shoving it in your face. And most importantly, it all services the larger story. He's really good at using the familiar as a framework to subvert or take little nasty turns or double down on camp. It can often be silly B-movie monster mash, remember? But all of the Jurassic sequels are to some extent, because why bother trying to touch the magic and greatness of the original when you simply aren't going to? Filmmakers who understand that tend to churn out better products in the franchise, which is why I love Jurassic World Dominion.